Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, welcome this morning. Uh, this morning, uh, we all know why we're here, but this morning we're going to have a presentation by the uh, PSCOA. Uh, before we do that, I, I wanted to make a couple comments. Number one, you can see I've taken my mask off while I'm speaking. And I would prefer that the, uh, whoever the speaker is going to be to take their masks off as well so we can all hear a little bit better. Uh, also, we have a court reporter here today, uh, Evan, and he has asked that uh, when you do uh, speak that you give your name first so that he can uh, uh, incorporate that. Um, this morning, uh, besides myself, my name is Bill Lowe. Uh, on my left, uh, on your right, is... Uh, uh, Mike Palumbo, and uh, on my right and uh, your left uh, is uh, Eric Stoltenberg. And uh, so with that, are there any questions that anybody up here has? So uh, with that, uh, I'll ask Chris Cook to go ahead and start us off this morning. Good morning, members of the panel. We are here for the Act 195 interest arbitration between the Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, we will begin this morning by introducing our elected officials. Uh, and I think it's important, which is why I'll have them not only introduce themselves, but also give their history within the DOC as well as their time within the union so that you have a good understanding of where they're coming from and where we expect to go. I will start, though, by thanking Mr. Stoltenberg, Attorney Stoltenberg, as our party arbitrator. Um, as you know, my name is Christopher Cook, representing the Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association. And seated with me here at council table is Todd Egan, also counsel with our firm. Uh, we are proud to represent the PSCOA, um, and we will do so dutifully this week. Um, we'll start with President John Eckenrode. Mr. Eckenrode, could you Tell the panel a little bit about your career with the DOC and when you began as a full-time detached member of the union. And if you just want to push the button so the light's green. My name is John Eckenrode. I'm the president for the Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association. Uh, I be began my career as a corrections officer trainee in July of 1999. Um, in, uh, April of 2007, I was promoted to sergeant. I uh, worked at SCI Crescent. I transferred to SCI Benner Township in 2013. Um, I was elected as the Western Region Vice President in July of 2019. So for 20 years, I spent inside of two different correctional facilities. Uh, in those 20 years, I worked, the majority of my career was worked on general population housing units and restricted housing units. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I was also a active CERT member for 10 years. You are, you were elected the Western Vice President. When did you convert over to the president of the PSCOA? I took over as president January the 25th of 2021. Mr. McNair. Yes. Hi, my name is Hank McNair, Executive Vice President of PSCOA. I started my career in 1996 at SCI Greaterford as a CO1. I did five years as a CO1, was promoted to Sergeant. In 2007, I took a voluntary demotion back to CO1 to transfer up to SCI Retreat. In 2010, I switched over to the maintenance department, became a maintenance repairman. And then uh, about a year later, roughly, approximately, I took the uh, trade instructor job as a plumbing trade instructor. SCI retreats closed. I've been uh, moved to SCI Phoenix, and that is my current position with the DOC. Um, as far as the union goes, I've been involved with PSCOA ever since 2001, when PSCOA has taken over down at SCI Greaterford. In um, July of 19, I was elected the executive vice president, the position I have now. Thank you. Mr. Triskowski? Yes. Hi, my name is Mark Triskowski. Uh, I am a corrections officer one from SCI Dallas. I started my career in July of 2000 uh, 
uh, as a CO1 at SCI Dallas. Um, I was there till 2010. In 2010, um, I was a, became the benefits coordinator for the PSCOA up until 2018. In 2018, I went back inside the institution as a corrections officer one at SCI Dallas back through the training program until I was elected in 2019 as the Eastern Region Vice President. Mr. King. Good morning, my name is Aaron King. I'm the Western Region Vice President for the PSCOA. I began my career in August of 1999 at Community Correction Center number two in Pittsburgh. Uh, January of 2000, I transferred to SCI Green as a Corrections Officer trainee. Uh, promoted to Corrections Officer 1 and remained there until August of 2007 when I transferred to SCI Pittsburgh when it reopened. Uh, November of 2007, I was promoted to the rank of Corrections Officer 2, a sergeant. 2009-2010, um, I was on SCI Pittsburgh's executive board. 2011 until their close in 2017, I was SCI Pittsburgh's local president. At their close, I transferred back to SCI Green and became the uh, president there in uh, 2018. Uh, September of 2019, uh, the executive board hired me on as a business agent for the PSCOA out of the Western region. And I had spent 20 years hard inside the institutions prior to taking on the job as a business agent for the PSCOA. On January 25th of this year, I was appointed by the executive board of the PSUA to the Western Region Vice President. Thank you. Well, last but not least, Mr. Johnston. Uh, good morning. My name is Ray Johnston. I started with the DOC in October of 2003 um, at SCI Graterford. I transferred to SCI Forest in January of 2005. Um, I became a sergeant September of 2012. Um, while at SCI Forest, I was local treasurer and local vice president for eight years combined. Uh, and in July 1st of 2019, I was elected uh, secretary treasurer with the PSCOA. Thank you. We'll now turn to President Eckenrode for his opening remarks to the panel. And we'll also have uh, Mark and Aaron hang out for their part of the presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. As I said before, my name is John Eckenrode. I'm the president of the Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association. I began my career as a corrections officer trainee in July of 1999. Like all H1 members, I was given a uniform and placed in the training academy in Elizabethtown. After a five-week training course, I returned to SCI Crescent, my home institution, to begin learning how to be a corrections officer. In 1999, life was a little simpler working inside of a state corrections institution. As a new employee, there were a lot of roles to learn and safety measures that, measures that you needed to follow. These requirements still exist today. In 1999, your primary function as an H1 member, whether you were a corrections officer, corrections food service instructor, or you were a member that worked in a maintenance department, was the security of the institution. Our members are on the front line. We are the first responders of the jail. When there is a trouble call, we are the ones that respond, disarm, deactivate, jump on the pile and de-escalate. We are tasked with care, custody, and control of inmates, and most importantly, the overall security of the institution. Even though life as an H1 member in 1999 was simpler than it is in 2021, it has never been an easy task. Over the course of the last 22 years, corrections has evolved into a multifaceted job description. H-1 employees are expected to carry out the same functions that H-1 members carried out in 1999. We have always been tasked with care, custody, and control. 
In the last 22 years, the care aspect of that trifecta has greatly increased. As long as I have been a corrections officer, we have always been first responders to medical emergencies. All H1 members are trained in CPR, basic first aid, and more recently, operation of a defibrillator. I would be willing to bet that there are several members in this room right now that have treated stab wounds, lacerations, head wounds, and performed CPR. Along with being first responders to injuries sustained from various day-to-day -day accidents and physical altercations, H1 members are on the front lines of the mental health pandemic that the Department of Corrections faces. That medical first responder role has increased to now being tasked as mental health first responders. Department of Corrections Secretary John Wetzel testified at a Senate appropriations hearing on March the 22nd of 2021. At that hearing, Secretary Wetzel stated that in 2011, the percentage of inmates that were identified as having a significant health, mental health disorder was 6%. Secretary Wetzel went on to say that in 2021, that number has risen to over 22%. In 11 years, we have seen an increase of over 16%. Over 22% of the inmate population currently incarcerated has a, quote, severe mental health disorder. This significant increase left the department no choice but to educate and train H1 members. They train members not only on the different types of mental health disorders and the effects of those disorders on an individual psyche, but also how to help that individual manage their disorder. They now function as mental health first responders. The H1 membership is now performing tasks that are in line with those that are performed by psychologists and psychiatrists. We may not be facilitating groups or administering medication, but we are the ones who are tasked with managing these types of inmates on a daily basis. We witness the deterioration, the breakdown and the violence that unfortunately is associated with mental health disorders inside of our state-run institutions. A good portion of that violence has been committed against our members. As recent as 2018, we suffered a tremendous loss with the murder of one of our brothers. Sergeant Mark Bazerman, Sergeant Mark Bazerman was brutally beaten by an inmate and then a short time later, he died from that beating. Most institutions now have a housing unit that specializes in treatment of the most severe mental health cases. Although the department has created these programs, there is simply not enough space to accommodate the need. Every housing unit and every jail houses inmates with mental health disorders. These inmates are sprinkled throughout. They work in the kitchen, in maintenance, and in the commissary. They work as custodians on our housing units. They live in our halfway houses. They move freely, sometimes more freely than, than inmates that do not have mental health disorders. In effect, all H1 members have witnessed and dealt with the mental health pandemic that plagues our institutions. We have members that work at our two state hospitals. Their job is not only unique, but it is also extremely challenging and extremely dangerous. They are titled as forensic security employees. These state hospitals house people that have been charged with a crime but have been deemed to not be mentally stable enough to go before a jury of their peers and tried. Not only are FSEs challenged by the prisoners that they are tasked with watching over, they are also challenged with the laws that govern how they respond to incidents of violence against other prisoners and staff members. In the eyes of the Commonwealth, these prisoners are considered patients. Because they are labeled as patients, it limits the members' ability to even defend themselves when attacked. Common sense tells us that handcuffs and other restraints are a great tool when attempting to stop someone from hurting others or even themselves. Handcuffs and other restraint tools are forbidden in state hospitals. Some of our members work in community corrections. These centers are a place for parolees to have some form of supervision, but it also allows them to act, be active participants in our communities. Unfortunately, not all parolees walk the straight line. Working in a community correction center can also be challenging and sometimes dangerous. Parolees have access to items that inmates may not have that are readily accessible. It is very easy for a parolee to gain access to drugs and weapons on the street. These items sometimes, unfortunately, turn up inside of our BCCs. In 2020, COVID-19 was introduced to the world. It quickly spread to all corners of the globe and eventually it found its way into our prison system. 
while the entire United States locked down and waited on the edge of their seats to see how devastating this pandemic was going to be, we continued to go to work. In the beginning, the uncertainty was excruciating. No one really knew what it was or how it truly affected people. When you turned on the TV, all you saw was COVID. The world was scared and rightfully so. At one point in the early days of the pandemic, other bargaining units that worked inside of our prisons were told to stay home. Members of management were deemed as designated survivors and took turns staying home for weeks at a time so that there would be someone left to command the jail in case of sickness or even death. They stayed home and continued to collect paychecks. The H-1 bargaining unit continued to go inside and deal with the uncertainty that confronted us. We have always confronted the fear of being physically assaulted. We have always confronted the fear of not walking out of the institution to go home. We have grave concerns when we are assaulted with body fluids. You wonder, what am I possibly exposing to my family? Now that worry has been compounded by COVID. It no longer takes being doused with body fluids. Now the only requirement that causes concern is showing up for work. It would have been easy for anybody to walk off the job and get away from the pandemic, and no one would have blamed us. There were lots of essential units that received hazard pay because they were afraid that people would simply not come to work. We received nothing. Although I believe that we are deserving of hazard pay, in some ways I am proud of that. In our eyes, we are the infantry, the grunts. Not only did we show up for work in the middle of the greatest pandemic in the last 100 years, we also volunteered to work in jails that we did not even belong in. We were called to go to Pike County when they were overrun by COVID. The county jail was so infested with COVID, they did not have enough staff to operate. We were called upon and we showed up. SCI Huntington and SCI Phoenix became COVID infested and needed officers and culinary staff. They needed help building a makeshift hospital to house sick inmates. Members from across the Commonwealth responded to that call. Several times the Commonwealth called on our unit and asked for help, and every time they called, we showed up. Healthcare workers and other agencies received a lot of publicity and notoriety for per performing during this crisis. We received little, and we're okay with that. We worked in conditions that I would argue were worse than most hospitals. We put our heads down and we went to work. The word hero gets thrown around a lot these days. I don't know that I feel comfortable using that word hero, but I can tell you that the men and women who walked into those jails and faced uncertainty, pissed off inmates, and a microscopic enemy called COVID every day are about as close to a hero as you're gonna get. Even though many of our members are college educated or they have certificates in the trades, it is not always a requirement to gain employee employment as an H-1 member. It merely requires a clean record and a high school diploma or GED. In many ways, being an employee of the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections takes much more than a piece of paper. We see things and we are part of things that the average person will never see or be a part of in their lifetime. Some are horrible things that leave lasting impressions that never go away. In the course of a career, you stand a good chance of being a victim of an assault. You will be a witness to violent acts committed against your fellow staff members and inmates. Every day you walk behind the fence, you put your life in your hands, in the hands of your fellow employees. It hurts tremendously when you witness the violence that is inflicted on them. This job profoundly changes your life. It changes the way that you think about people. <laughs> you see people in a different light. You lose trust in humanity. You tend to stay away from crowds. When you are in a crowded situation, you attempt to place yourself in a position to be able to view as much of the room as possible. You run escape routes through your mind just in case something goes wrong. When you are engaged in a conversation, you cannot maintain eye contact because you are constantly surveying the room. 
At some point in time, your friends and family look at you differently because they know that you are no longer the person that you, that you were before corrections. You have changed, and not necessarily for the better. You become cold and indifferent to things that normal people cannot even have a conversation about because it's too uncomfortable. This profession takes a toll on your family life. Because corrections is a 24-hour business, we work odd shifts. We're expected to stay past our regular eight-hour day, sometimes at a moment's notice, and we work mandatory overtime. We work holidays, we miss baseball games, and we miss birthdays. I have personally been a victim of an assault by an inmate. I know the overwhelming feeling of terror that runs through your mind when assaulted. I have responded to staff assaults and witnessed the look of terror in members' faces when they are fighting for their lives. I realize not everyone that is assaulted is truly fighting for their life, but at that time, you feel like you are. Even if it is not you that is being attacked, the violence that you see has a profound impact on the individual that witnesses it, and unfortunately, most times, it has an impact on the people that the individual cares about. In the next four days, you will hear testimony concerning violence, COVID, health benefits, the economic positioning of the Commonwealth, and proposed language changes that we are seeking. I believe that we will be able to show that this unit is unique. We will be able to prove that this unit is very much essential to how our Commonwealth operates. Lastly, I believe that we will be able to prove that this unit is deserving of what we are asking for. We may not all belong in a corporate setting, but we are professionals. It takes a special person to do the job that we do. The overwhelming majority of people that I know from corrections are hardworking, smart, articulate, good men and women that deserve to be properly compensated for the job they do. I cannot tell you why every individual makes the choice to become an, the employee of the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. It is a choice, and I thank God every day for the people that have made that choice to serve this Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you. From its inception, the PSUA's mission statement is to promote and improve the corrections profession to ensure that our members are treated fairly, with respect and dignity, ensuring the welfare of those employed in corrections who unselfishly protect and serve the citizens of this Commonwealth. That mission is no more important today than it was when it first started, and these members are represented by a great group of people here. Our membership serves in 24 state correctional institutes, two state forensic hospitals run by the Department of Public Welfare or Department of Human Services now, 10 community correction centers and one training facility. Where our emphasis in past arbitrations has been on the CO and the CO2, you will hear a lot more about the rest of the unit. And that's because this group of people is here to ensure that not just the COs and CO2s are taken care of, but the wall-to-wall -wall unit. In terms of a breakdown of the H1 bargaining unit, we have just shy of 7,500 correction, corrections officer trainees and CO1s. We have just shy of 1,200 sergeants making up a total of 80% of the bargaining unit. I'm going to skip over maintenance and trades for one second and point out we have 491 food service instructors, 404 forensic security employees, which are the first level employees at our forensic hospitals, 41 forensic security employee twos, which are essentially the sergeants of those same hospitals, and we have 174 community correction monitors. And the reason why I skipped over the maintenance and trades is because if I could draw your attention to tab E of the binder. <coughs> you'll see quickly that that number of 1,000 is spread across a number of different trades, maintenance, 
so on and so forth. You can see that we have 31 automa automotive mechanic trade instructors, 11 barber instructors, four barber managers. Mr. King, in terms of these trades and maintenance posts, what are those folks doing that your average CO isn't in terms of running a jail? So when you're dealing with the uh, maintenance trades um, and, and maintenance in general, they, these men and women in these classifications are tasked with not only care, custody, and control of inmates, they also are responsible for ensuring that uh, the lights are always working, the heat is always on, the cell doors always lock, day-to-day uh, -day maintenance to include, you know, making sure the grass is cut, the snow is removed, our transport vehicles, our perimeter vehicles are all operational. Your unit makes each one of these institutions self-sufficient? That is correct. If you look at this next slide, it represents where our facilities are. And one of the biggest reasons why I like to show this particular photo is that if you are familiar with this state, then you know that none of these institutions are necessarily in a readily accessible location. And over the last 10 years, we've seen a number of institutions close and since we last saw you, Mr. Arbitrator, we've actually had two institutions close. One, we were fortunate enough to have close in the backyard of its new institution, and inmates and staff alike could literally walk from one to the other. Mr. Truskowski, I would like to talk to you briefly, though, about SCI retreat closing, and what does that look like for members who wish to keep their job and the amount of work it takes to just stay employed? SCI retreat, when SCI retreat closed, uh, the members, obviously a lot of them worked very, lived very close to SCI retreat. When it was announced that they were gonna close, they were put in a 90 mile radius, uh, uh, given institutions in a 90 mile radius of SCI retreat. So it would now take your commute from say 10 minutes to 20 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half to, uh, for some, a lot of our members. A lot of our members were forced to go to, you know, institutions like SCI Monroe, SCI Frackville, uh, SCI Waymart, SCI Phoenix. So it took your day-to-day -day time schedule and added on maybe another hour to two hours as things as as it progressed. And Mr. King, you actually testified about going back and forth between Pittsburgh and Green, um, with its closure reopening and closure again. Uh, how did that impact folks on the West in terms of commute times and just maintaining a job? So it actually uh, affected the members greatly. A handful of members uh, were fortunate enough to transfer to SCI Mercer, uh, and they were still tasked with the outside hospitals at SCI Pittsburgh, or uh, in the Pittsburgh area. However, with lack of those hospitals, the membership's average drive went from maybe 20 minutes to a minimum of an hour to an hour and a half. Now, you both used the words kind of forced to go to other institutions. Nobody was forced to go to any other institution. They could have just taken a layoff or a furlough, correct? They could have, sure. But they continued to work. They did. All right. So let's talk about the insides of these institutions. When both of you started, with corrections, as I understand it, the, the units that you could be sure of on, in any institution was an RHU and maybe an SNU? That's correct. What yes. are those? RHU would be a restricted housing unit, um, which would be, be your uh, level five unit inside of your institution for inmates that um, are unruly inside of the facility, that receive misconducts for fighting, for uh, smuggling drugs inside the institution um, and basically breaking the rules within the inmate handbook. What was a special needs unit? Because I think that was kind of a catch-all originally. So your special needs units uh, began with inmates that uh, suffered from certain mental uh, disabilities. Um, 
and they were they didn't meet the criteria or the, for a state forensic hospital they were actually sent to a state prison so that most of these men and women in these units are medicated uh, and suffer from some psychological defects that you know created more of a um, a need a special need for a closer contact with them so I know in in your in your 20 years being on the job and my 10 years since I've been working for the PSUA the list of those inside units has grown exponentially which is this list here behind me um, these units do they exist at every one of the institutions a, a vast majority of these units are in every institution we have all right so I just want to highlight a few of these what is a step down unit A step-down unit would be, they would have a unit, um, the R2 being the level five unit, they would then take an inmate or, or a BMU, a behavior management unit, and then they would have a step-down unit where the inmate is not is partially compliant, but they're giving them rules and regulations to follow to become compliant to fall uh, within uh, general population. Okay, so as I understand it, you go to jail and you have rules to follow. Correct. If you violate those rules, you go to the RHU. Correct. And if you want to get out of the RHU, you have to follow more rules? Correct. In the step-down unit? Correct. And if you behave in the step-down unit, then what? If you behave in the step-down unit, then they will give you the carrot to go back to general population. We have the VSU, the Veteran Service Unit. What is that? So the Veteran Service Unit was designed um, to coexist with, with basically veterans court. Uh, so the veterans unit is supposed to be made up of inmates that had served in the armed forces, not necessarily honorably discharged, um, but they had just served, whether you know three months, four months, whatever, or four years uh, to a career in the military. But that unit is designated to help them uh, receive their VA benefits and everything that goes along with uh, military service. Are, are there some, is there something unique about the needs of a veteran inmate as opposed to a non-veteran inmate? The only, to me, the, the only unique thing would be that they were actually a veteran of the United States military. Um, the unfortunate fact is they still became an inmate what is an intensive management unit? An intensive management unit is for inmates that need the utmost uh, care, custody, and control um, that are not able to, one, be in general population, two, be in the RHU, so now they're in the intensive treatment unit, where these inmates um, are not only have intensive security, they also have psychological um, needs that need to be met, met. and uh, they have many, many um, hours of treatment that goes on to try to help these inmates with their uh, mental, mental concerns that they have. How about young adult offender units? That kind of goes without saying, but... Correct. The young adult offender is for inmates that are under 18 years of, old, of age um, that commit a crime that are sentenced to the state level. The last one I kind of want to go over with is the incentive living unit. What is that? The incentive living unit is, is unique that the Department of Corrections created. Um, if these inmates follow the rules, follow the regulations, and play the game, they'll be given pizza, they'll be given popcorn, and they might be able to watch a PG-13 movie. Aren't these the same rules, though, that they had to go in and abide by originally? They are. Okay. Your minimum job duties as a CO or a CO2, have they, 
have they actually changed over that same period of time? Yes. Okay. So they give you additional training for all these different units? Not always. Okay. With each one of these units that's no longer a general housing unit, how much more interaction do you as COs or other staff members have with the inmates on these units? In these units now, there there is, I would say, twice to maybe sometimes three times the amount of interaction than your actual general population with what our members are actually dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis with these inmates. So in the, at the end of the day, my understanding is that the Commonwealth wants to make sure that they can be released back to the public, productive members of society. From a CO standpoint, when you have to interact more with an inmate as opposed to less with an inmate, what risk does that create for you? The more interaction you have it, it, with, our, with our profession, with our career, is you are at more risk of being injured, assaulted, or um, quite possibly worse, being killed. And is your risk of assault increased or decreased based on how good of an inmate is behaving according to the unit? No. Okay. Let's talk about our institutions. SCI Albion, tell us a little bit about Albion. So SCI Albion is uh, located uh, about 30 minutes south of uh, Erie, PA. Um, level 2-3 institution, uh, but has a lot of, I, I won't say a lot, but a, a, a good bit of level 4 inmates. Now this has the diversionary treatment unit. What is that? Uh, so the DTU was, the way I understand it, is basically a hybrid of the SNU. So it's just another acronym for an SNU. Okay. Now we've pulled numbers in each one of these slides. You'll see uh, staff numbers, COT, CO1 numbers, CO2 numbers, and those come from our own population reports the capacity in the census for each one of the institutions actually comes from the DOC population reports, which are actually found at tab I uh, of your binder. Each one of these tabs for the panel's information, or each one of these slides, was written up with the most current information. Um, and that'll be, that'll be discussed here in a little bit. This particular institution is operating at 96% of capacity with an even just an inmate to a CO ratio of 26 to 1. Is that accurate? So those numbers quite possibly could be accurate as far as capacity and the, you know the 95.9%. However, your ratio is built off of those overall numbers and not necessarily what a corrections officer is surrounded by on a daily basis. Understood. Tell us a little bit about Benner Township. So uh, Benner Township was uh, built in, in, basically it was supposed to be a replacement institution for SCI Rockview. Um, State College area is where that is. Uh, it actually has the transportation hub where inmates are transported um, from all over, to the all over the state to the hub. And then from there, their institutions pick them up and take them wherever they're going. So, for instance, a bus could leave SCI Green on Tuesday, take inmates that are going to Benner to the hub, um, which those inmates could be then going to Phoenix, Chester, Mahanoy. Those transport teams would come pick those inmates up and take them out of there. Now, you said Benner Township was meant to replace Rockview. Rockview remained open, correct? That, that is correct. As a matter of fact, Benner Township opened as SCI Green or SCI Crescent and Greensburg closed. That is correct. What's the travel time for the folks that were originally at Crescent and Greensburg who are now going to Benner Township? The commute for those guys it could be a uh, minimum of 40 minutes to an hour and a half. And it's my understanding they now rent buses and commute together. That is correct. SCI Cambridge Springs, what's unique about Cambridge Springs? SCI Cambridge Springs is a, a female facility, female inmate facility. Now, from the outside, it looks like 
a boarding school? Boarding school, old hospital, looks like, yeah. Okay, is that what it looks like on the inside? I would be lying if I told you anything. I, due to COVID, I have not been able to get in there yet. Understood. So this is a, a female institution. Uh, is there anything unique about their, their levels in terms of threat levels? Nothing unique. They're, they're female inmates. Uh, they're, they are an inmate. They're no different than a male inmate. Okay. And you have both females and males working in this particular institution? Yes. All right. How about Camp Hill? SCI Camp Hill, uh, located here in the Harrisburg area. Um, uniqueness to SCI Camp Hill is it's the classification center for um, all commits coming into the Department of Corrections. So why does an inmate need to be classified? Well, an inmate comes from the county um, and is sentenced to state time. They need to come in and they need to be, first of all, medically evaluated, psychologically evaluated, and vocationally evaluated. And what, what does that, those evaluations do for those inmates? They will then make a, a decision on, um, A, their custody level, on B, their um, IQ level, uh, where they are for uh, education, where they are for vocation to receive a job or something like that, um, and where they are medically. Um, are they going to be able to be able to be housed in a general population housing unit, or they, do they have special needs as in, as in medical problems with maybe a bad heart or a kidney problems or something like that, or they're just, um, you know, they have bad, bad legs, bad arms, bad, bad backs. So that's when the medical department would have to make a determination. And they're also quarantined there for a period of time for tuberculosis. So let me uh, ask you this. Tuberculosis check. An inmate goes through SCI Camp Hill, and they evaluate their history, their criminal record, their mental health history, their, their medical history, and they assign them a classification, and that inmate ends up at SCI Dallas where you were. Correct. How much of any of that information do you get as a CO when you have that inmate come onto your block? I'll get his name, his number, and his custody level. You don't know his history. You don't know his status. You strictly know his name, his number, and his custody level. Correct. And if he's on a special needs unit or some other type of unit, then something in his background put him there. Correct. Okay. The census right now is showing that SCI Camp Hill is operating at 54% of its capacity. Is that normal? That's not normal. Why not? The reason why it's not normal is because the uh, governor of Pennsylvania and the Secretary of Corrections decided during COVID to go ahead and release inmates that were um, very close to their parole. Okay. Tell us a little bit about SCI Chester. SCI Chester's in uh, the southeastern part of Pennsylvania, um, on the outskirts of Philadelphia. Um, they are a predominantly level two institution. Um, all uniqueness about that is that everything is indoors. Um, they, uh, it's a tower setup where they have different towers for their housing units. Um, and in the opening, uh, when SCI Chester initially opened, it was a therapeutic community uh, institution. How about Cole Township? SCI Cole Township in the Cole region of Pennsylvania. Um, very, very neat setup where it is on the side of a mountain. Um, the overall, the number one thing for Cole Township now, their number one mission now is our day of the parole reception center um, for parole violators to come in back to the Department of Corrections. What does that actually mean? How, how does a parole violator get back to the institution? When an inmate's on parole, uh, inmate, they are giving a, a set of rules to follow while they're out on parole, rules and regulations for them to follow, and, and they have to meet with their parole agent uh, weekly, monthly, whatever is in their, uh, their plan. And if an inmate violates that and it absconds, and the parole agent will then you know, find them make a determination if they violated their parole when it was strong enough for them to be sent back to an institution, then they go back to SCI Cole Township. How much of what that particular inmate does outside do you as a CO get to find out when they come back? 
we find out that he violated parole and came back inside the institution. You don't know what he got into. You don't know what his charges were. You don't know what he's bringing back into the institution medically. Correct. You just know that he violated. Correct. How about SCI Dallas? SCI Dallas, uh, Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. Uh, my home institution is, uh, is an older facility, um, an open bar facility. Um, they always called it the old dinosaur. It, it, it's a uh, very, uh, you know, it's, it's a bigger institution. They, uh, the, the thing for Dallas is they have a veterans treatment unit there and a therapeutic community. You worked at Dallas. Correct. Now, the total CO classification per shift, if we look at the manpower survey and shift schedules, runs close to about 100 people, which would put the inmate to CO ratio institution-wide at 14 to 1. Correct. How big is the largest housing unit at SCI Dallas? When I was an employee at SCI Dallas and a block officer, we housed um, on, on our big blocks, we had upwards of 200 to 210 inmates. And how many total officers are working on that block during a shift? At 98% of the time, there are two officers on a housing unit. Okay, so there's going to be a, a bubble sergeant and one other officer? There's no sergeants on the bubbles there. Okay. So you have 210 inmates? Correct. And two officers. Correct. So, I, I, I mean, it's easy math there. It's 100 to 1. Correct. How is yard handled at SCI Dallas? SCI Dallas? Pre-COVID. Pre Pre-COVID. There would be four officers and a sergeant inside the yard. The institution would then um, start calling out the blocks, block by block. And a, on a Sunday afternoon in the middle of the summer, you would have upwards to 1,500 to 1,800 inmates in that yard. With a fistful of officers? Four of us. Do you have posts? Do you move around? We have, uh, <clears throat> in the early days, we, we did not roam. We, we had designated posts. Uh, later on, we just started to rove around the, uh, the yard and uh, observe the inmates as they're out in recreation period. How about SCI Fayette? SCI Fayette uh, was actually considered to be the replacement institution for the first time SCI Pittsburgh closed in Fayette County, level four institution. What do you mean level four? So the, ma the majority of their inmates are custody level four inmates. And how do you, how do you achieve custody level four? So, uh, various ways. Uh, as Mark had stated earlier, you know, coming in through Camp Hill after being classified, depending on their crime, it may be some previous history that the DOC may be aware of. They classified the inmate as a custody level four inmate. So that's usually the starting point for the majority of the inmates coming into the system. Now, Fayette has this STGMU. Yes. It is the Security Threat Group Management Unit. That is correct. But it's already a level four. Is that like a four plus? Is it a five? So those those individuals there should be considered a level five, but they might also possibly be classified as just a five T, just because of their housing status. And what's a five T? So it's a level five inmate, but it's only considered temporary because they have the potential to not be a level five in the future. Okay. At SCI Forest. SCI Forest was also constructed in, and opened at the time, uh, around the time that uh, SCI Fayette opened uh, with the closure of SCI Pittsburgh the first time. What is a behavioral modification unit? So the behavioral modification unit was another uh, unit that transposed from the original long-term segregation units. Uh, basically, the inmate is a behavioral problem. All right. So, so I understand, and I have a little bit of history in criminal justice. They couldn't be trusted based on their behavior to be out in public, so they were sent to jail. Is it because of their behavior out in public or inside the jail that makes them go to the behavioral modification unit? It was during their time of incarceration. Okay. So they've continued 
to be a nuisance. Correct. Okay. But SCI Frackville. SCI Frackville um, on the I-81 corridor in Schuylkill County um, is a protocol type, a pro prototypical type uh, facility. And their number one, um, what they do there is they have a service dog training program. And is that for COs or for inmates? The inmates train the service dog, train the service dogs. Okay. So inmates are training service dogs. Correct. As part of what they're getting to do on the inside of the institution. Correct. And where do their serv those service dogs go? They go out into the community. Okay. When you say prototypical, what do you mean and how does that compare to SCI Dallas? SCI Frackville, as you can see in the picture, it's more of like a wagon wheel setup. Um, the, uh, the blocks uh, are not like in SCI Dallas. Um, they have different pods. They uh, have, do not have the open um, cell doors that we would have at um, SCI Dallas, and they also have, would have block sergeants. They're programming. Um, they have program service, but they have a program service building. You know that that is unique to them compared to something like an SEI Dallas. Okay, so when we talk about a prototypical, at least in this sense, the housing units are set up, at least in theory, to provide the CEO with better visibility of who's on the unit. At times, accurate? okay. Um, the doors are not what we consider traditional jail doors of the old iron bars. Correct. Okay, so they have pie holes or wickets that you would pass things to and from. Correct. And in terms of programming, you send them to a, a school building, essentially, on site. Correct, a program service room. Okay. SCI Graterford closed since the last time that we saw Arbitrator Lowe. Um, where did the inmates and the staff from this institution go? They all went to uh, SCI Phoenix. Okay, and so if we hit that 30,000-foot view, we could actually view both both institutions within the same picture. You could throw a baseball from SCI Greater for ACI Phoenix. Understood. When did Phoenix officially come online? 2019. 2019. Okay. SCI Green. What's unique about SCI Green in terms of their inmates? So in, in its onset, SCI Green uh, used to house the capital case inmates for the state up until roughly approximately about a year ago. What caused that change? Um, litigation. So where are those inmates now? They're throughout the state. I, I believe actually a majority of them may have went to Rockview. Okay. Um, so folks like Mumia Abdul-Jamar, or Jamal, who killed Danny Faulkner, He's no longer at SCI Green. He's out in general population somewhere? Quite possibly, yes. Okay. So it looks like SCI Green has a number of these specialized units. Did that occur before or after this litigation? So the only ones that occurred after the litigation would have been the MCU, IMU, and I believe the PVU. Everything else was already in place. The capital case unit was still there on its way out. Okay. And why are these... Why do these units pop up after litigation? It just basically because the department created new programs and needed a place to put them to utilize the space that was there. Understood. SCI Houtsdale. Uh, SCI Houtsdale, uh, another one of our institutions. Um, it's, I believe it's a level three institution as well. Now, is there a canine unit that operates out of Houtsdale? And uh, I believe that is the canine unit, uh, probably similar to the dog training program. Okay. So do we, and I'll, and I'll kind of jump out of order here. Do we have a canine unit that operates within the H1 bargaining unit? We do. Can you briefly describe to the panel what the canine unit members do? Yes. So the canine unit is, ta is assigned out of central office. However, it's makeup is from H1 members from all across the state, uh, broken down in the regions, uh, CO1, CO2s, and they are actually canine handlers. It's uh, the drug interdiction unit. Um, they are tasked with searches. Their canine dogs uh, are 
drug sniffing dogs. Uh, some actually uh, can um, s sense cell phones, um, electronic devices. Uh, they search visitors coming in, inmate cells. Uh, they've unfortunately had times that where they have actually even used had to use the dogs on staff members. And where do they operate out of, and, and what's their reach within the state? So each individual has a home institution, such as, we'll say, SCI Green. However, their, their training is based out of SCI Rockview. And they typically keep the handlers regionalized from the institution region that they came from. So a Western office, uh, somebody from SCI Green would stay typically in the Western region for his or her duties throughout the work week. So SCI Health still has a COTC, a co-occurring therapeutic community. What's unique about that? So the co-occurring is, is basically it's a therapeutic community, which is the therapeutic community is designed for uh, individual s substance abuse problems, uh, alcohol, drugs, whatever. So the co-occurring portion becomes where they may also suffer from schizophrenia or, or bipolar. So it's considered a co-occurring they're dealing with two specific issues in one what does that do to the job of the CEO for those types of units so those types of units become a little more uh, intensive because for lack of better terms it's you know an, an SNU inmate a DTU inmate that now has um, substance abuse issues so their state could be volatile at times Again, as a CO, you just know that they've been placed on that unit. That is correct. <coughs> How about SCI Huntington? SCI Huntington is, is very unique in, in the heart of Huntington County there. It was modeled and perfectly designed from the old Eastern Penitentiary. It's a wagon wheel design. It, too, uh, like Chester, is all indoors for staff in the housing units. Okay. SCI Laurel Highlands? SCR Laurel Highlands is a, for lack of a, it's a uh, hospital style setting, open dorm style setting, uh, modular housing units, a lot of infirm uh, and sick inmates at SCI Laurel Highlands. This is also your aging population up at Laurel Highlands? That is correct. Okay. SCI Mahanoy? SCI Mahanoy um, in Schuylkill County off the uh, 81 corridor is another prototypical facility um, and their, their uniqueness there um, is you know they have a DTU, an RTU, a THU, a TC and an RHU. This particular institution is still operating pretty close to 100 percent. Do you have any understanding as to why? Other than just they, they weren't moved? They just weren't moved. So let's go back one. Laurel Highlands is operating at 62% right now. Has that number changed over the last year and why? So their numbers uh, drastically went down at the onset of COVID due to their dorm style setting and the fear of the spread rapidly because there's no way to um, secure an inmate in a cell to quarantine because it's an open dorm setting. All right. And so for the safety of the inmate, they were released? Yes. Yes. They that came along with the uh, governor and the secretary, well, the secretary's plan uh, to get as many out as he could that met a certain criteria. Okay. SCI Mercer? SCI Mercer, uh, level two institution. Um, no programs up there. Is this a prototypical as well? Actually, I, I wouldn't call this a prototypical. Um, it, it's a little bit of an older facility. Um, so they have like round housing units. It's different. Okay. SCI Muncie. What's unique about Muncie? SCI Muncie is the uh, Eastern female institution. It looks like it has a, a significant number of units comparatively to Cambridge Springs. Is there a reason for that, or they just happen to have that capacity? It is set up. Uh, there are cottage-style buildings 
at SCI Muncie, um, and they have, you know, they do have the YA, YAO and YOU um, programs there for the, the um, juvenile inmates that come in. Okay, so as I understand it, it looks a lot less like a standard institution on the inside? It looks like a, uh, it, it is a, yes. <laughs> okay, and so in the DOC's mind, that promotes these different therapeutic communities and units? I believe so. Does that change for you guys as COs and you ladies as COs um, the threat level of these inmates? Unfortunately, when an inmate is, is sentenced to do a state sentence, an inmate is an inmate. All right. SCI Phoenix, which is in the backyard of Greaterford, um, is this the largest capacity jail in the, in the state? It is. Tell us about Phoenix. SCI Phoenix is, is, is vast. Um, if you have eight hours in a day, I know I've only been able to get through one side of SCI Phoenix. It is two institutions split in half, the east side and the west side of SCI Phoenix. Now, as I understand it, because right now it's operating at just shy of 90%, it was opening to alleviate Greaterford. Correct. When Greaterford filled into Phoenix, it was over 100% capacity. Correct. Okay. What about SEI Pine Grove? You, what's unique about your offenders there? So SEI Pine Grove is uh, was built in uh, as a juvenile facility. From from a CEO standpoint, there is there is there much of a difference between a juvenile inmate and an adult inmate? So there is there is a a, a great difference there. Um, in the law in the lines of the terms of a, a juvenile is a, exactly that even though they they might be an inmate um, when those inmates assault you and you have to use force it is at certain times very frowned upon because they are considered a juvenile understood tell us a little bit about the Quihanna boot camp because this is not an a traditional institution as a matter of fact it doesn't have a fence or walls it's out in the middle of a forest no the Quihanna boot camp it, it, the title is exactly that it's a motivational boot camp uh, and, and an attempt to instead of sending them to a state facility the the courts had, had sentenced them to the boot camp to in essence hope that the uh, offender would get some sort of motivation and, and restructure of their life to become a productive member of society how how does it operate in terms of day-to-day -day life versus, you know, being in cells, going to chow, going to yard out? Uh, I, I believe it is more of a structured environment that they, they deal with, uh, like a boot, boot camp style setting that so they move. an actual military or paramilitary? Paramilitary. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about SGI retreat closing and the impact on members continuing to work. Mark, can you tell us, did retreat actually close when it was supposed to? It did not. When was it supposed to close? Why didn't they actually shutter the doors when it was supposed to? When SCI retreat was, was originally slotted to close, COVID came into effect. So what they did with SCI retreat is they used it as a quarantine area for inmates with COVID. Was that quarantining from other institutions or those folks coming in? From they were for the inmates that were coming in from the county facilities. Okay, so who was still working at retreat then? Our staff, our H1 bargaining unit staff from retreat. Were your staff provided any additional medical training? No. So they were strictly there as a potential greater increased exposure to COVID. Correct. And you have no idea where these folks are coming from, what they've gotten into, but in the meantime, you know COVID spreading rapidly throughout the state, the country, and the world. Correct. Okay. And if they made it through SEI retreat, where would they go? They would then be sent to uh, SEI Phoenix, uh, I'm sorry, SEI Camp Hill for classification. 
Okay. How long did retreat stay open after it was officially, unofficially closed? I believe it was close to maybe six months. Okay. SCI Rockview, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, SCI Rockview is, is one of our older institutions. Um, the, like um, Huntington, it's the tiered um, barred doors. SCI Smithfield? Uh, SCI Smithfield, uh, prototypical. It uh, actually has a regional infirmary now. What does that mean? So uh, with COVID, the department originally wanted to convert the hub at Benner into a, a giant infirmary, but that didn't work out, and it wound up at SCI Smithfield. So are you sending COVID folks to this infirmary, or are you sending inmates? I believe it was originally designed for COVID. Okay. Is it still operating as a regional infirmary? I'm uh, not 100% certain on that. SCI Somerset. Uh, Somerset, uh, level 2-3 institution, prototypical. This one's also operating almost at 100% capacity. Yes, not a whole lot of movement out of there. They are also the uh, centralized uh, laundry services for the other institutions. So who's... Who's doing the laundry? Uh, it's a combination of inmates and uh, maintenance personnel. Okay, and so that laundry is being shipped from other institutions to Somerset, laundered, sent back out. That is correct. Okay, so even though we're not transporting inmates, we're transporting their dirty, soiled clothing? That is correct. Okay. SCI Waymart? SCI Waymart in Wayne County is the old Farview State Hospital. Their mission there, the uniqueness there is they have the FTC unit. I have a 100 bed FTC unit um, at that institution. And what is that? A forensic treatment unit. Those inmates there are definitely mentally unstable enough not to be in population, but they're not as um, sick to be in a state hospital. So those inmates are, are there at SCI Waymark. So let's talk about community corrections. There are 10 CCCs as we sit here today. Um, what happens at a community correction center? So your community correction centers are basically your uh, inmates that are not 100% ready to go back home or may not necessarily have a home plan approved that they could go to. So they report to a community correction center. Typically there they are required to receive some form of employment uh, they might still have to follow up with uh, AA meetings, NA meetings. Uh, they have to report at certain times. They have curfews. The majority of them are not allowed uh, what is considered a furlough to leave the facility for X amount of time. Are there bars? Are there cells? No, these are actually, a lot of these facilities are homes, old homes that are broken down into multi-room um, multi-bed rooms. So there could be four to eight beds in a particular room in these homes. Okay. And with the exception of progress. And generally these releasees are, are permitted to come and go as their schedule dictates. That is correct. Okay. We operate two forensic state hospitals, um, one in Norristown, one in Torrance, essentially the east and the west. Uh, can you tell us what causes a person to go to either one of these hospitals as opposed to an institution? So these individuals here have not been sentenced yet. They may have been charged, they were charged, but they have not been sentenced. So a, a court has sent them here for further evaluation uh, on their mental capacity and state. Are, do we have cells here? What's the actual setting on the inside of these hospitals? So my experience is only with uh, Torrance, because that's in my region. And it, these are not cells. These are rooms as well. There could be two to four uh, patients in a bedroom, or possibly even more. They are not secure. They have freedom to move about the building. There's still folks who have been charged with a state-level crime? Yes. 
Do they have the same, they meaning the forensic security employees, do they have the same training and expectations that you do have as a CO? No, their, their training is a little different. Uh, in the state hospitals, the forensic state hospitals, uh, they have like a, a MANT training, and it's their version of defensive tactics, um, which is very scrutinized uh, against our employees, our members. Okay, so when you go through the academy, you're taught defensive tactics that includes throwing punches or... Yes, strikes against the inmate, yes. Okay. MANT training... There are no strikes. No. There's a side bear hug? Yes, it's, it's basically all designed as self-defense, but not aggressive. It's all defensive manners. Okay, so passive-aggressive defensive That's tactics? That's the best way to describe it, yes. Okay. So we also have some members of our unit that are detached to do the training academy. When you guys came on the job, how long was your training academy? Five weeks. Five weeks. And how long is it now? Currently? Yes. Currently, it's two weeks. Is that because of COVID? Correct. Is it still five weeks pre-COVID or after COVID? Correct. So in 20 years, your training academy has, last, has not grown any more than five weeks? Correct. In 20 years the minimum standards to get on the job has not changed, correct? Correct. In the last 20 years, though, your expectations from your employer have increased exponentially. Correct. 300%. Okay. So what does your five-week program look like in the training academy? And if I could draw your attention also to tab G, which is actually the 2021 basic training program syllabus. So your basic, your basic training uh, curriculum will consist of report writing, uh, code of ethics, uh, DOC policy, uh, handgun, shotgun, um, use of force, uh, defensive, lethal, less than lethal weapons. OC training. When do they teach you how to deal with mentally infirm inmates? That's not during your basic training. Um, when do they send you for your psychological degrees? To the best of our knowledge, none of our members have got those yet. Okay, Does, at least not by the DOC. Not through the DOC, correct. Okay. How much has actually changed when it comes to basic training over the last 20 years? The overall dynamic has changed because of the mental issues that we are found dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis now. So let me ask you this, Mark, because you went through when you came on and then you went through recently. Correct. For an old head going back through the training program, what was new and unique? You, you, new and unique was the mental health aspect of, of our job um, on the more of how they wanted you to um, try to verbally de-escalate an inmate even if an inmate would, would assault you. Now you go through the academy for that now. How is that being translated to existing COs? Existing COs might have a one-hour class in their mandatory training uh, once a year to talk about the different programs and the different ways they, the Department of Corrections now wants you to treat inmates. So let's talk about that, and we'll turn to Tab H. What are we looking at there at Tab H? Tab H is basically the breakdown of what goes on inside the training academy um, on the different days. So that's at the actual training academy? Sure, correct. Okay. How much time are you spending on training after the academy? They have a mandatory, there's mandatory training uh, that's done every year of 40 hours of mandatory training, which is now, in the past it was 40 hours, but the department has now added on more hours of training. 
So what's involved in your mandatory training after your after you matriculate to CO1 status? Every year you would have to requalify with weapons, uh, pistol, shotgun. You would have a, a suicide prevention, first aid, um, CPR training, CBTs, computer-based training, where they put a bunch of information on, um, on the computer, and then you're required to sit there and uh, take the training, watch the programs, and take a test when they're done. Are the food service instructors required to do that? Yes. Maintenance and trades folks? Yes. What type of training do the CCC monitors go through? The initial training that they receive at the academy. Do they have mandatory updates later? I believe so. How about the FSEs at the state hospitals? They have updates as well. Okay. And so they're doing that essentially learning on the job? Correct. Okay. What types of tools are offered to you right now within the institution in terms of doing your job safely and effectively? The, the biggest thing we have right now at our, at our side is the OC pepper spray. How long have you had OC? We've roughly only had that about two and a half years. What did you do before OC? It was all hands-on or try to talk your way out of the situation. Okay. Has OC increased or decreased your ability to control situations? I believe it has increased our status. Okay. I do want to talk about, because we've touched upon it over these slides, inmate populations. And if I could draw the panel's attention to tab I, and also you gentlemen. In, at the end of January 2020, the DOC's monthly population report indicated that institution-wide, we were running at almost 97% at capacity. Um, if I read this correctly, we had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 different institutions that were operating in excess of 100%. If we go to the very last page, as of March or April, as of April 2021, the DOC institution total, we're operating at an 83.4% capacity. Correct. And somehow between the two, I think we lost about 2,000 beds because the bed capacity went from 46,400 to 44,700. Is all of this change COVID? It, was there something else going on here that the inmate population reduced dramatically like that? This was, as I testified earlier, this was the incentive to release inmates from prison early. So, and COVID was used as an additional excuse for that? Correct. Are we seeing recidivism rates go up, or, or is that even something that you guys worry about as COs? We're we are very concerned with recidivism rates, as we always have been, uh, because of the rapid rates that the doors were open to let the offenders out. Does it change your job on the inside, though? No, the job is still the same. Even when they come back, it's still the same. Okay. Because we've harped on years past. You know, we're operating at 90, 95, 100% at capacity. Even with a decreased number of inmates across the state, has your job become any easier or safer? No. Okay. Not at all. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions as on cross? I am. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Pat Harvey, representing the Commonwealth, along with Vince Champion, and we have Ed Phillips at our table here. But uh, we, we have some issues. We'll probably address in rebuttal. But we have no questions at this time. Understood. 
If I could ask the panel for about five minutes. Okay, I think we're about ready to resume now. You take your seats. I appreciate it. Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure. We're going to continue on with the testimony of Mr. Ackenrode, potentially supplemented by Mr. McNair. John, what was the minimum qualification that you needed to meet when you came on the job? Um, like I said, I was hired in 1999. Uh, specific to Crescent, I can't speak for every institution across the state. Um, the minimum requirement was a high school diploma or GED, and at the time you were required to basically be a veteran. Okay. And what did the job look like back when you started? Uh, the job was a lot different than it is right now. Um, they basically were looking for military or paramilitary people that had the ability to follow, follow orders. Um, learn and you know what the established roles were and enforce those roles upon inmates okay how did that change over the course of your career in uh, terms of expectations the 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 training pretty much remains the same with the exception of some of the mental health training that we do receive now but the uh the requirements of what it takes to actually be a corrections employee in 2021 compared to, to 1999 has changed drastically. We are expected to interact with inmates more than, you know, more than ever now compared to what it was in, when I first got hired. In 1999, you were there to do a job. You were there to enforce the roles. You were there to make sure that inmates did what they were supposed to do. And if they did not do that, then you, it was your job to make sure that, that it was reported properly. And now you're more of uh, you're still the corrections officer that enforces those roles and reports role violations, but you're also expected to almost be like a counselor. We talked a lot about the different units that are on, on site at different institutions. Did you deal with any particularized units as you were coming along? Like I said, my, the 20 years that I worked inside, my primary role was um, general housing population blocks and RHU at one point in time uh, they created a SSNU a secure special needs unit at SCI Crescent um, I opened that unit and that unit was specific for basically they took the the most severe mental health cases that we had in the state of Pennsylvania that could not be in general population and they were in an RHU setting but what they did was they put I, th I believe our capacity at that time for that SSNU was right around 40, and we got 40 of the worst um, mental health cases in Pennsylvania, 40 of the worst behavioral cases in Pennsylvania, and we put them in an RHU setting. How did that evolve? Um, it, not only was it RHU, but they, were, uh, they received mental health treatment also at the time. So they were... You know, living under the, the, the rules that were established as a level five housing unit, but we also treated them almost like they were in an MHU setting, a mental health unit setting. Where did that SSNU ultimately go to? Uh, the SSNU program uh, ended up being uh, eliminated, and what derived from the SSNU program is more on lines of uh, the secure needs unit. Okay. In an RHU. Does every CO, CO2 staff member work in one of these specialized units? No, the majority of the, I know we had a slide up there at one time and we listed every um, acronym and I can't even tell you how many there are. There's a, there's a bunch of them. Uh, for all the specialized housing units that we have across the state, um, the majority of the people that work in those housing units are handpicked by either a unit manager, a uh, shift commander, sometimes maybe even a superintendent or a deputy. Okay. So if you are, for lack of a better term, if you're, if you're not on the unit, you probably really have no idea what's going on there. The people that work there that are, are chosen to work in those units work there every day, eight hours a day. Okay. Um, so they would definitely have a leg up on somebody that 
just kind of walked in the door and was expected to perform an eight-hour shift. Is the DOC looking for 1999 John Eckenrode to hire right now? I've been told I'm a dinosaur. Uh, corrections has passed me by. They are looking more for uh, treatment-oriented people. Are they requiring any specialized training or degrees of your members? The uh, minimal requirements that existed in 1999 still exist today. So over the past 20 years, your minimum standards have stayed minimum. The expectations, though, of the DOC have increased. Greatly, greatly increased. How, how else have the expectations of the DOC increased over time for your rank and file members of the H-1 bargaining unit? Can, I'm sorry, could you say that again? What other expectations have changed and increased over time? Um, the, the onus that they put on you now, uh, as far as um, we were taught, if, if you know, force was necessary and, and it comes to that point in time, use force and, and it was, I mean, it was always reviewed, but once the review was done, the, the scrutin, scrutinization part of it was minimal. And we are extremely scrutinized now anytime that we use force. Even when it's completely justified? 100% justified. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and, and I've uh, unfortunately been involved in plenty of uses of forces. Um, and where I sit now, I review a lot of uses of forces and the, the use of force that we see, major, the majority that comes across the desk, desk is uh, justified and it's still hotly contested. Let me ask you this though, in terms of the population, you know, the DOC has gone to great lengths to identify their needs and set up programming to address those needs have these institutions become any less dangerous to you as an H-1 bargaining unit member? In the 20 years that I spent inside institutions, it is now more dangerous than it's ever been. What do you attribute that to? Uh, I attribute it to the programs that we are running and the treatment programs that, that the Department of Corrections is um, implementing across the state. And not only the treatment programs itself, but the, the mentality, whether it comes from um, the government or if it's coming from the Secretary of Corrections, I'm not exactly sure where that originates, but we're basically trying to get as many people out of prison as possible. So we lowered the standard of what it takes for an inmate to parole to, to be released. And it used to be um, we set a standard the inmate had to meet the standard to, to be released. And then once they were released out on the street because they showed positive behavior, um, the standard outside in the centers and, and through the parole agents was high to where if, uh, if an inmate, you know, couldn't function out in society because they, you know, missed a curfew or they uh, produced a hot urinalysis, they were brought back to jail. And we've dumb that process down so far where we have multiple hot urines before you have to come back, miss curfews, and like the, you know, we call ourselves corrections, but um, we kind of eliminated the correction portion of corrections. So you slowly erode the standards for inmates and it puts more dangerous people nose to nose with you. Yes. and. You know, unfortunately, I, I've, I've said this before, you, you see what's happening in, in some of the bigger cities in the United States right now. You see how the uh, police officers are, are being treated. We've been living under that umbrella for a decade now. Um, the inmates feel that they can uh, do less as far as this is what I need to make sure that I'm taken care of while I'm inside. I get the incentives that are there, the commissary, the uh, some of the recreational programmings that they have for inmates. And it used to be, and I'll use the phone system for an instance. Um, I can't remember exactly what the numbers were, but a level four inmate may get one phone call per week. And a level two inmate could make unlimited phone calls. We've dumbed it down so far now that 
every inmate gets a phone call every day as many times as they want to make phone calls. So there's no incentive for me to do the right thing while I'm incarcerated. I'm just going through my time as an, as an inmate, and I can either um, you know, do what I need to do in 1999, I had to do what I what I needed to do to get those incentives that were provided by the Department of Corrections to now we just give them to everybody. I wanted to clarify the training academy right now runs two weeks. They're shoving all of that five weeks into two weeks. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, during COVID, uh, there was a point in time where we closed the training academy for, and I don't want to specify what the time was because I can't remember. But our, our training classes got backed up so bad that um, the Department of Corrections came to us and we together worked through um, how we were going to identify and, and what we were going to do to make it, you know, make the training academy better as far as getting people back in the jails because the overtime was so incredible that we needed to, to get new trainees back into the system. And what we came up with was a two week, 15 day program that it's basically that, that five week program that we talked about that, that I experienced, we condensed that down into two weeks. And our people right now, I, I wanna say probably six months, and I might be a little bit off on my time frame, um, have been going through that academy in a two week span, working 12 hour days for 15 days straight. And not only did that affect the trainees that had to participate in that two week program, but our instructors have been, you know, working through that that process also. So they're they're not getting any less information, they're just getting it condensed in a shorter period of time. Yes. And then expected to hit the ground running when we get to the institutions. Yes. Mr. McNair, I wanted to talk to you a little about your history in the DOC because mm -hmm. it obviously differs from your standard CEO because you were in the trades. What What's required to even get into the trades aspect of the H-1 bargaining unit? Um, to get into the trades, you need experience in, in multiple facets when it was a maintenance repairman, or now they call it maintenance foreman. Um, to be a trade instructor, you needed um, four years of experience. I, I think they call it journeyman. And then you also needed to pass the civil service exam. How does that change your pay? or the expectations of the DOC for you? Um, when you're a trade instructor, your pay range is 37, where a regular uh, maintenance foreman is 35. Um, with that, you're expected to train the inmates um, in their job or their trade, whether it be plumbing, electrical, carpentry. Um, the one thing unique, though, we talk here today about the programs on how um, the DOC has set up all these programs. The one they took away, which I think um, was doing very well for the inmates was the apprenticeship program. So in the maintenance department at the time, the trade instructors would teach them. Um, they would have a set up program where they could actually get to an apprenticeship program and be able to take that certificate out into the community. They no longer have that. The Department of Corrections did away with that. And in my eyes, that was something that helped. It kept the inmates um, interested in doing their jobs. And you've seen less recidivism from the ones, in my experience, coming back that got those certificates. So those, those not only incentivized the inmates, but it also provided an actual transferable skill and certificate. That's correct. What types of things do you have to do as a foreman or an instructor um, in order to keep your credentials and keep doing those jobs? Um, there was no programs really that was set up and once you once you were approved it was just the training you had to go through every year and what's expected of you in dealing with the inmates when you're dealing with a trade so the trades is no different than um, a correction officer you still have care custody and control of the inmates and actually you, sometimes you have more hands-on um, from my experience you, you would deal with a group of um, inmates, gentlemen in, in, in my, because it was always with the male institutions, of a group of eight to 12 inmates. And you would see them day in, day out, five days a week. Um, sometimes you felt like not only you, you know, they would come to you with all kinds of issues. So your interaction with them was much greater and much higher than as John spoke about when we first started back in, I started in 96. So 
Was the expectation to interact with the inmates, did that come from the DOC or did it just come from the inmates themselves or did it evolve over time because of both? I, in my experience, I would say it evolved over time, o over both. Um, if you had inmates in your program and um, the respect went both ways, they, they treated you with respect, they wanted to learn. However, the DOC, we tried to keep it, I, I can only speak about myself, tried to keep it that um, the experience with the inmates was to keep them involved and keep them coming back. Like I said earlier, doing away with the apprenticeship program was a big hurt to the facilities. And yet then we're still trying to deal with inmates to keep the facilities running, like you spoke about earlier, because that's what we did with the inmates. So it, it's much akin to the relaxing of the standards for the inmates on the housing units, because it de-incentivizes them to continue to work towards getting out. Yes, uh, exactly. Thank you both. Do you have any questions as to cross? Okay. We are actually about five minutes from the hotel telling us that we need to start lunch. We're ready to hit like a breaking point and come back unless any one of the panel has any questions for our members this morning. Any? Okay. No, I think we're okay as far as questions go. When do we need to come back, Chris? <coughs> Probably one one fifteen. About one fifteen. Yes, sir. Okay, let's go ahead and break now, and please come back in. Uh, be ready to go again at one fifteen. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope everybody had a nice lunch. And uh, Chris, I think we're ready to start with you again. Good afternoon. If I could draw your attention to tab D of the binder, what you'll find is our Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association regional chart. And the reason why I've put this in the binder for your review is to show we have a unit of 10,760 members spread to the four corners of this Commonwealth. We have five elected officials who are on detached duty working out of Harrisburg. But a lot of this work would not be done uh, without the help of the BAs, our grievance coordinator, our benefits coordinator, 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 I could talk. And I also want to point out too that these business agents, many of them, <coughs> many of them have only recently started as business agents. And again, these folks are coming from the institutions. They're not career union folks who have spent a lot of time outside of the institutions. And I say all of that to say that we have a group of people here running the PSUA that have a good sense of what the membership wants and needs because they were there. Um, they weren't there very long ago. Uh, so they have the finger on the pulse of the membership. And that leads me into talking about our proposals briefly, and if I could draw your attention to tab B, you'll see that we have a list of four pages worth of proposals. And I won't go over them today ad nauseum because what we will do is discuss them on each individual day. I will let you know that for presentation purposes, tomorrow you will hear the testimony of assault victims in the morning. Um, there will be pictures and videos that are fairly graphic in nature. Uh, understanding that there's no other way to show just how dangerous this job is without showing those things. Tomorrow afternoon, you will hear the testimony from Katerina Spineris, a PhD on member wellness. On Wednesday, we will begin with the testimony of Jeremy Krimmel, our economist, followed up by Mr. Krimmel and Hank McNair to handle certain economic specific proposals where it's strictly, strictly a monetary issue. On Wednesday afternoon, we will be dealing with the classification upgrade proposals on page four. And for that, we will receive the testimony of Mr. Ralph Winters. On Thursday, we plan to present in the morning the testimony of Bill Einhorn, the Pennsylvania State Corrections Officers Association trustee for PBTF as to our medical benefits and our medical benefit proposals. Following the testimony of Mr. Einhorn, we will have our executive 
staff come back and discuss the remaining proposals. And unlike years past where we have honed in on the big ticket items, we have to impress upon this panel that the not so big ticket items are important to these folks as well. This isn't just a CO bar bargaining unit. There's a number of different classifications and we wanna make sure that wall to wall it's taken care of. We have a number of proposals that touch upon issues strictly for certain members and change benefits for a number of members. And the reason why these proposals are set up the way they are is because this body of people went through this contract with their members in mind to talk about that and figure out what it is that they need to change. So from there, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about that bargaining history. In 2001, the PSUA became the PSUA. They had always been part of AFSCME. And that was a tightly fought battle. And of course it should be, because AFSCME was losing 10,000 people. And from 2001 to 2011, the PSUA was PSUA by name only. Because if you look at the awards and you look at the way that the PSUA was treated, they may as well have been AFSCME. They got the pattern, they got treated like AFSCME, and they were strictly PSUA by name. And in 2011, that tide turned. And you have a group of people who work towards creating a name for themselves and separating themselves not only from AFSCME but from every other bargaining unit in this Commonwealth as well they should. There isn't another bargaining unit in this Commonwealth that you will ever be able to compare. Not local guard units, not police units, not AFSCME units. And that's because of the unique nature of the job and the way that they are spread out. And in 2017, we believe that we finally set ourselves apart in saying we're not the state police, we're not AFSCME, we are the PSUA and these are our members. And here we come out of a pandemic and we're going to bargaining. We're going to interest arbitration for a 10,000 member unit. And there are people out there in the legal field, in the labor field, there are people in this unit who say that's absolutely crazy. I disagree. You go to this forum when the risk is outweighed by the reward. And for this unit, I'm gonna suggest that they have nothing else to lose. The Commonwealth has taken and has taken and has taken. And since we last saw you, Mr. Arbitrator, God has taken. He's taken members of our unit through COVID and he took Sergeant Mark Boserman through a vicious assault that you'll be witness to tomorrow. These members showed up day in and day out when people got to stay home. These members showed up day in and day out at institutions, and I'll note that you didn't hear anything about state-of-the-art filtration systems at any of these institutions. Congregate setting, it's meant to keep people in. Well, guess what else it kept in? COVID. This body of people have put in the work. They've done exactly what has been asked of them and they've continued to work. And I'll ask you to draw your attention to tab J and look at the number highlighted at the bottom of the page because this unit has 10,761 members in it. And that yellow line down there, H1 statewide grand total that's the number of people in this unit that contracted COVID since March of last year. This number was up to date as of May 12th. That's obscene. There's people in the Commonwealth under the co governor's jurisdiction who are still working from home and have not seen the inside of their office since March of last year and over 30% of this bargaining unit contracted COVID 
because they had to go to work. And I'll offer one more exhibit as we move into watching a video prepared for this arbitration, and it's that second page of tab J. When the Commonwealth, the Governor, and the Secretary of Health said stay at home, mask up, socially distance, and the Commonwealth told these members back here, go to work, go to work, go to work. The question was, where are the masks going to come from? This is the price the PSCOA paid to ensure the H1 bargaining unit had masks, good masks. Because there's a lot of masks out there right now that are being made by inmates out of a cloth that looks like old cloth diapers. And I'll suggest to you that you or I wouldn't want a cloth diaper over our mouth any more than we would want COVID. But this is what they did for their members and their members showed up day in and day out to do this job, an already disagreeable duty that's unsafe. But then in the face of COVID, when people have and continue to work from home or simply continue to collect a public benefit paid by tax dollars that are coming out of these guys' paychecks. So with that, we will offer a video for the review of the panel and close the day. Scientists in China say a pneumonia outbreak appears to be linked to a new coronavirus. The warning from the CDC, the coronavirus is spreading so quickly around the globe, it may only be a matter of time before it begins rolling across the U.S. with the potential to become a pandemic. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here's what we know. A Washington state resident fell ill. After in the beginning, I, I remember very distinctly, we were in a town hall in Meadville. I'm um, talking about violence. And I got a phone call from a, a state senator and he basically gave me a heads up, hey, we're gonna be, we're gonna be locking this, the, the entire country down here pretty soon, it looks like. They pretty much locked the entire country down for a couple weeks and while other people stayed home, our members had to go to work inside of a congregate setting where it was almost impossible to social distance. The world completely changed for everybody else but us. We continued to go to work. The inmates continued to do what they normally did on an everyday basis and and we just, you know, wrote it out. Absolutely, we're essential workers. Not only essential, we, we are critical to how this Commonwealth operates. Um, somebody has to go in there and do what we do. We can't just lock the doors and walk away. There has to be people there, and those people are us. Sam Wills. I worked at uh, SCI Lower Highlands for 15 years. At the very beginning of COVID, uh, it was a mad rush to get in, uh, inmates out of Laurel Highlands uh, as per the governor's orders. A lot of trips taking non-paroled inmates out because of COVID, because they said they were low offenses. We went from uh, 1,600 inmates down to a little over 700 inmates during the whole pandemic. They stopped a lot of the inmate movement, but a lo not a lot of the inmate movement that they could have. Uh, inmates were told that they had to wear a mask, but they weren't forced to wear a mask. And of course, all the employees were forced to wear a mask as a, a condition of the employment. We weren't uh, hit in the first wave of COVID at Laurel Highlands. It wasn't until later on towards uh, October, uh, November, and December is when we got hit with the COVID. We really got hit hard. The COs, the staff, and the inmates uh, were a few hundreds. Everybody was dropping like flies. I'd be on a on a housing unit with the officer, and next thing you know, they say, "Oh, he's he's out on COVID." Every precautions that we took, it wasn't it wasn't enough. There there was no way we could get away from it. Working inside a prison as open as we 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 work at, they never had staff in mind when they were thinking about protecting anybody. They were they wanted to protect inmates and, and send the inmates out that were lower level ones to, to protect them from the COVID. 
There's no doubt in my mind that I got it. I got it working from working at the prison. We've always had like flu outbreaks. That that was a common occurrence, um, but we've never seen something spread as fast and you know be as deadly and make people as sick as they were as what we experienced with COVID. Congregate setting, and it's very hard to social distance. And once it gets inside of the jail, it spreads like wildfire. And, and we've seen that, where we had maybe uh, a handful of positive uh, people that we found through testing. And within days, we went from a handful to dozens, and then from dozens, we went to hundreds. As of a couple months ago, we were in the neighborhood of 2,000 to 2,500 of our members that actually became positive from COVID. And unfortunately, we've had three staff members, three of our members, uh, die from COVID. John was very, um, he had a very strong idea of what was right and what was wrong, like the law was the law. I think a lot of that had to do, you know, he did his four years in the military. He had at one time, his father was a police officer years ago in their uh, municipality. And so that was always a big part for him. Um, if someone was willing to work to help themselves, he would bend over backwards to help them as well. If he cared about you, you know, nobody better mess with you because he would get in their faces <laughs> and take care of it. Um, he loved, but as funny, as strict as he was about right and wrong, and this is the way things should be done, you get him with a small child or animals, and he was a big pushover, <laughs> and he had the hugest heart for them. Even when he was feeling his worst, he didn't call off. He went in, he took extra shifts, you know. He was just, he was a worker. He was a corrections officer at Camp Hill uh, Institution. As a corrections officer, of course, maintaining the running of getting the inmates to and from where they needed to be, um, preparing inmate passes, uh, getting them um, to sick calls and such. He would also occasionally even go to, if an inmate was in the hospital here in Harrisburg or Hershey, uh, he would go and sit and do a shift there sitting with them. The working conditions, at least climate-wise, uh, having to do with uh, ventilation and things, that was always a problem. I know he was a little concerned because I, he did feel that the inmates were getting a little, they were protecting them more than they seemed to be protecting the, the officers. He started feeling flu symptoms. It was the first weekend in October of 2020 and um, just feeling not well. So right away he realized, well, I need to get tested. It was something they required. I started getting cold-like symptoms, not feeling as bad as he did. And then I believe it was on a Tuesday or Wednesday, we went to urgent care. He got tested, was tested positive, and immediately let his friends that he worked with in his group know. And they were then informed within that week that someone else that worked in that area tested positive, not their shift. And they, I don't think they were informed until after he tested positive. And then he was home just hard. He never left the bedroom. He didn't leave the bed. And then the following Monday, we video chatted with our primary doctor and they suggested he go in because they thought he was dehydrated. And when he went into the emergency room, they realized his oxygen levels were low. And then he was just in the hospital after that. I, I had to walk him into the emergency room. He was so weak, he couldn't even cross, and we parked right in front of the door. I wasn't able to go in, and then it was perhaps a half hour later, he called me upset, saying they went to put me on, they went to uh, put me on a ventilator, and he was, he had high anxiety anyway and was claustrophobic, so that all scared him, and they said that his uh, pulse oxygen levels, I think they're supposed to be in the high 90s, and his was in the low 90s to 90 and because he could not handle the mask going over his face for oxygen, they'd have to intub um, intubate him. And they figured a week and he'd be better. He started to improve where we were able to text, we were able to talk on the phone, we video chatted once or twice, but then things took a turn for the worse the next weekend. They transferred him to Hershey, he was there like, got there like late Sunday into Monday, 
pretty much it was very similar to how he was at Good Samaritan where they had to keep him so sedated because they bring him out, his anxiety would flare, which of course is going to make your heart race faster and make your lungs work harder. And that's what they were trying to avoid. But unfortunately, he was hooked up to this ECMO machine, which pretty much oxygenates the blood for you and then puts it back in because they were trying to give his lungs a rest. He went into acute respiratory failure. His They described that his lungs were turning into cement because they couldn't do everything that needed to be done to reoxygenate. So, and of course, this whole entire time, I couldn't visit him. I couldn't go in at all. They weren't allowing that, which I understand. Um, so then on Saturday, November 7th, which was a month to the day from when he tested positive, the, hosp- the doctor called me at six in the morning and said, he's really not doing well. I don't think he's going to make the day that he said, I thought he was turning the corner earlier in the week, but um, he had gotten another lung infection on top. So he had both a viral and a bacterial infection, and it was just destroying his lungs. He said, if we unhook him from everything, he wouldn't be able to to make it. I said, you know, that I, I was ready and that they could remove him. And I think perhaps he only lasted 45 minutes after they unplugged everything. And uh, it was kind of hard because, of course, nobody could come with me. The hardest part was making that call to his dad on the way home. So I waited. I had to wait like two hours. I couldn't do it. When John got sick, his dad was just a wreck. And some of the hardest calls I've ever had to make were those daily calls to let him know how he was doing. And then his John's stepmother and I would have to try to translate it in a way that his dad would think positive. But I would hear him sobbing in the background, which was absolutely probably one of the hardest parts of this to deal with and then I think it was this maybe the second week in December uh, both I got a call from John's brother that his dad and his stepmother both went into the hospital and they both tested positive she was released but then he was in the hospital and passed away five days later but he had said after what happened to John he didn't want to be on a machine no ventilation nothing so he passed in his sleep within a week. The one thing that sticks out with this is I'm 48. He passed two weeks before my birthday. And it's weird now to fill out paperwork and status as widow. Because I'm 48. He was 50. You know, he could have retired in April of last year. And we had done our wills, but we had never talked about, wow, this is how I want my funeral to be, and this is this, and we had a five-minute conversation about it, and then that was it, and I had to come up with the rest, and that was just the place I didn't see myself being yet. Prisons are, are made, they're built to keep people inside, and you know, whether it's an older facility or a new facility, the way that prisons are built helped keep the virus inside also. In the newer institutions, we don't have access to open windows, so there is no fresh air coming in. Everything gets circulated through AC units and, and you know, whatnot, and it, we, you know, pretty much circulated COVID throughout the jails. Some of the older jails that we have, um, they're still open bar cells, so there is no, like, it's just, it's out in the open. It's out there. And, you know, the the way that we conducted activities, you know, on a, during the day with, with inmates also contributed to, to spreading. Joshua Wilson, I work in Arstown State Hospital. It's sort of a, I'll say a hybrid between a, a jail and a hospital. It's people that um, are mentally ill that have criminal charges probably averaged like 10 bedrooms. There's some rooms with two beds, some with four. Then they have a large like living room type day room. They're never like locked down in the cells or, you know, they're always 24 hours a day, they come and go. And there's no social distancing in that setting. We, we do have like a air circulator, but um, it's not very effective. And um, a lot of the units it's, in the summertime, is, they're brutally hot. You know, in uh, winter it gets cold. I mean, it's it's an older hospital. And at one point, I believe, is late 2019, um, 
for security measures, I guess, they welded the windows shut. So we, we couldn't even open the windows to get fresh air through. When it first started, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, no one knew what was going on. When we would interact with the patients, I don't necessarily know who has it or not. You know, it's kind of a guessing game. The Department of Corrections created a dashboard to help us track or help the public track um, the, the amount of positive uh, inmates and staff members inside of the facilities. Uh, we found out at some point in time that their, their dashboard was inaccurate and they, they attempted to do some kind of contact tracing and um, we asked that, that they just identify who reported positive so that we could go back and say, well, you know, I worked with that guy yesterday. And the Department of Corrections, uh, they, they would not let us know who was positive. At one point in time, we, we you know, we were so um, infested with COVID that it actually stopped the system. At one point, it was over 50 employees that were out sick and, um, you know, it, we weren't, we weren't sure if we were going to have enough people to staff the, the buildings. You know, we would work short. Um, you know, they, they would mandate people to work double shifts. You know, a lot of us worked upwards of 80 hours a week through the, through the worst of it, you know, six, seven, eight weeks that were really bad. It definitely is not an option to just call out because you're, you're scared of getting the virus, you know. We advocated for lockdowns just to stop people from coming into contact with each other. They did uh, lock down for a time, and that creates a lot of overtime. It creates extra work for staff members, and it's 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 physically taxing on people, and um, it's it's mentally taxing. Every day that you walk into a jail and you work, you always have the the fear, the worry of. What's going to happen to me? Am I going to be okay? Is it's am I going to face some kind of violent act today? And not only did we have to face that every day, in 2020 we we faced COVID. So not only do you have to worry about yourself, which we've always worried about, now I got to worry about what I'm bringing home to my family and the people that I care about in my community. During a time, you know, I really I was unsure of who I was around that that was positive and. Um, I didn't know, so, you know, at home I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't be around my children. Um, you know, my wife, obviously, I, you know, I was kind of quarantined myself. There's 10 siblings in my family. I have nieces and nephews born that I didn't even get to meet till this year. You know, a lot of us took precautions in order to fulfill our job duties, you know, and it, it affected our home life negatively. In the very beginning of no November, my wife called me at work. Uh, she was crying and pretty hysterical that uh, she had just tested positive for, for COVID. I immediately went to the medical department and said, my wife tested positive for COVID. I'd like to get uh, tested. They tested me and it came up almost instant that I was uh, infected with COVID. I was asymptomatic. I didn't have any, any symptoms, no temperature, anything like that. So I went home. Um, made arrangements for my other kids. I have two step step uh, kids and my uh, son Archer uh, to be picked up by my sister. So we were away from our kids and not infecting our kids. And for uh, a week and a half, I waited on my wife, who was uh, very sick and very pregnant at the time, almost nine months pregnant. I waited on her hand and foot during the COVID. It was the 20th of November, and uh, Nancy hadn't slept for two days. Uh, she was in pain. She couldn't breathe. She was she was in pretty bad shape, and we were we were uh, very concerned. She told me to take her to the emergency room. I got her to the emergency room. Uh, I went to go in with her, and they were saying there was no way that uh, that I could could go in with her because of, of us both being positive with COVID. Uh, she had to be almost carried inside. She was she was doing so poorly. 
She was really scared. They got her on oxygen. She, her pulse ox was, was down to like 88. We got there at two o'clock in the afternoon and they didn't get her back into the emergency room until midnight. She had to wait in the waiting room and, um, for 10 hours. So that was tough on her also. And she was, she was pretty hysterical about being there alone. Phone calls and text messages is all, the, all I had to uh, communicate with Nancy during this whole time. I wasn't hearing anything from her. You know, she'd message every once in a while, and I said, I, I gotta call the, I gotta call the hospital. I called the, the maternity ward, and the doctor says, we're going in right now, we're gonna, we're gonna deliver the baby. We're gonna help her out as much as, as much as we can. During delivery, they actually had to, to suction Luna to, to get her out of Nancy, because Nancy was, was so weak with, with COVID and being there that she wasn't, she really wasn't able to push, so they had to assist with her delivering the baby. It wasn't until five days after Luna was born that I was able to go and pick Nancy and Luna up uh, at the hospital and I got to see her for the first time. It was hard for me being a protector and a provider like I am and, and, and feeling as, as hopeless as I did was, was too much to bear. morning with the breaking news that Pfizer is shipping out the first doses of the coronavirus vaccine as we speak with hopes that this is the beginning of the end. In 2021, we finally see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the vaccine's been, been approved by the FDA and I fully expected to, because of where we work and because of you know the amount of COVID that we've seen and experienced, I, I really expected to be in that first wave, and somehow we got put into the 1B phase, and um, I, I, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I, I felt very disrespected. At some point in time, the Department of Health prioritized um, obese people, smokers, and pushed them in front of, and pushed us back even further in the 1B where you know we just couldn't get our hands on this vaccine. Uh, we, we went to the media, we talked to legislators, and a lot of legislators went out and talked on our behalf, and we still could not get pushed to the front. And you know, lo and behold, uh, I get a phone call one day from the Department of Corrections. They tell me, hey, we got a vaccine. Um, we're gonna start to roll out inside of the institutions, and we're gonna start with staff. And you know, I was grateful. I was very happy to get to, have, to hear that news. And we start to roll out, and within a couple days, they they pull the vaccine off of us because there was some complications with people, you know, having um, blood clots. The vaccine rollout began, and, and people started lining up to take the vaccine. They made in staff, and then they had uh, some extra vaccine left over that um, because people refused to take it or had already been vaccinated and those vaccines just went to waste. Instead of taking them somewhere else and saying, hey, we got 150 doses. Does anybody want vaccinated? You know, let us know and we'll do it. They just disappeared. Shock and frustration. State prison inmates will soon get the dose and some cash for being vaccinated. The state corrections department says that they rolled out this statewide inmate incentive in order to tell inmates that if they get vaccinated, they can get some cash. Meanwhile, the state's nearly 11,000 correctional employees want to know why should inmates get shots before them? Here we are begging for a vaccine. We find out that, that not only are the inmates getting it, but they're incentivizing the inmates to get it. They're giving them a $25 um, commissary coupon to take the vaccine. We had a lot of members get sick, a lot of members that were required to quarantine to make sure that other uh, staff members didn't get sick. That created massive amounts of overtime. Uh, we were called upon to go to other institutions, uh, Pike County, was completely COVID infested. They, their, their staff numbers were so low that they couldn't operate the, the jail anymore. So we were called upon by the, uh, the Department of Corrections. They asked for volunteers to go work at Pike County. And when they asked, we stepped up and we did that. But when we did that, that created a void in the jails where these people left from. 
Uh, we were called upon to go to Huntington to go to SCI Phoenix. And every time that call came, we, we went. The mental anguish of, of people that, that care about you when you're going to work in a setting like this is, you know, now it's, 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 it's compounded because they do worry about you, your safety when you go in there on a regular day without COVID. And now they have to worry about you um, going in and, and, and contracting something. And that takes a toll on your family. Good morning to each of you on this 12th day of March, 2021. You know, it's been exactly one year since we found out about uh, this disease called COVID. And I honestly believe none of us uh, would have expected or anticipated uh, what we've dealt with over the past year. This has easily been the most uh, challenging circumstance that's happened in this country, certainly in my lifetime and in most people's lifetime and easily the most challenging thing this department's ever faced. And it's been devastating. You see these chairs next to me represent six of our coworkers who paid the ultimate sacrifice for serving their fellow citizens. They died in the line of duty from COVID. At one time, somebody had told me that God, even though I'm not having a good relationship with him right now, allows you to pick your parents. And I think Kyle chose me because he knew I wouldn't take second best. There's nothing that kid did, did, couldn't do that he didn't excel at. I was proud of him as the heavyweight wrestler that he was, as a matter of fact, senior year. Um, he was not the, the glory hounds, but he was the one who took a backseat to all the glory hounds, even though he was known as Kurt Angle's little brother because they're not, you will not find anybody who can shoot like him. Uh, he would be down on his knees as a heavyweight and he would take out guys who didn't know what hit him and would come. And so at the last day I was like, they had better honor my son for being the man that he is. And they stood up and they said, and out of all the wrestlers, I cannot wait to see what this man does with his life in the future years to come. And unfortunately, it was shortened. And I was looking forward to that too, to see what he would become. After graduation, um, he definitely did not want to go to college. He chose, because of my ex-husband, uh, to go into corrections. So when he said that he was going to do it, I was like, oh my God, I don't know about that. And my ex-husband's like, no, listen, seriously, if he does that and he stays, he can retire early, he can go as far as he wants. I cannot tell you how he actually adapted and he thrived. And I, I got to tell you, I did not realize his impact on his job until I talked to the men he worked with. And then I realized that's exactly where he was to be. Um, and when I heard that when he passed, the inmates were upset, that says a lot because he was fair. And one of his, uh, I don't know if it would be a lieutenant or a sergeant, came up to me and he said, he handpicked Kyle for um, his unit. And he said, I will always have your back. And he said, because you're always my lead guy. So Kyle was the big guy and he went in first. And so, you know, so that's what it was. And then I found out how respected he was by, which I knew how respectable he was, that um, he actually was growing into be a man and a good man. So I, at his funeral, unfortunately, I learned a lot too late that he is exactly what I hoped he would be. He calls me and he said, I think I have COVID. So I'm on the phone. And I'm like, why do you think you have COVID? He said, mom, I have a sinus infection. I'm starting to really not feel good. And he said, and I have four or five guys on my unit, enclosed, no ventilation. He's like, mom, I think, you know, I have COVID. So we had discussed earlier and I said, you know, I'm worried about COVID. I'm worried about you. I said, tell me about the ventilation. And he said, mom, I work in a jail. There's no ventilation. I said, that's what worries me. I said, the viral load. 
So he called me like we every day. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling bad. Um, my cough is bad. It's getting worse. It's getting better. So we went through that until he says to me, Mom, I went out to get my Tylenol, uh, my ibuprofen, because my fever started going back up. He said, when I came back in from the car, my SATs were 50. And I said, son, I said, honey, we've got to get you to the hospital. I said, if we don't, you're not going to make it. And he's like, I know, you know, he's sitting there and he's breathing. And I just keep talking to him. And I just kept saying, I love you. I love you. Because I was afraid he was going to COVID code there. And um, I'm two and a half hours away. I can't do anything. So he was admitted to the COVID unit and in complete isolation from everybody. And we started off with the non-rebreather. We went to high flow, natural progression of COVID. You go to high flow. Um, he couldn't be maintained on that. Then we put him on BiPAP. They put him on BiPAP. And he was doing not well, but doing. I had a call from a doctor and he said, I want you to know, I beg Kyle daily to let me put him on the vent. And he refuses right now. He thinks he can be strong enough to do this. And I said, oh, I'm gonna kill that boy. But my son was told when you can't do it anymore, that he would be vented. And he suffered all day without being able to breathe. So we tried out of it, which did not work to calm him down to breathe, because I thought maybe it was anxiety. And it wasn't, it was his lungs failing. And then that night, um, he crashed and had to be vented. And I had said to him that night, and when he was begging me to get him vented, I said, if we get you on the vent, I may not be able to get you up. <laughs> and he said, Mom, I know. He said, I can't do it. He said, Mom, I can't do it. I, I can't. He said, I want knocked out. I want on the vent. And don't wake me <laughs> until I'm healed. And he never healed. And on the 20th of January, the fire, 506, he was pronounced dead, and I must honestly tell you, I pray to God that he's peaceful, and that he's happy, and that he doesn't hate me for what I had to do, but it was not my choice, COVID took this from me. Kyle's number is 400,000, but he was not just a number, but he is a number in the COVID scheme. Thank you, members of the panel. And with that, we rest today. We rest for today, Chris? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much for that. It's very gripping. Okay, uh, we will meet back here tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock again. So uh, I'll, anybody have anything else that they need to say today down here? No, sir. Okay. Chris, you're okay then? Thank you. Okay, we'll see you all tomorrow at 10 o'clock then. Thank you. <laughs>